All right. Good evening, everyone. We are in the weekend studying three vital topics. We've already looked at who are the 144,000. We took a look at the place of the of the um, that group at the end of time, that last generation, that final generation of people that will be alive on the earth. We looked at some identifying characteristics of them. Tonight, we're going to look at the seal of God, what that is according to the Bible. And of course, tomorrow night, maybe the most intriguing of all the meetings, the mark of the beast. And what is it? And so, a uh, big weekend, very interesting weekend. And uh, glad you all decided to come out tonight. And you're not going to be sorry. You're not going to be sorry. We, uh, we, in our most recent meeting, took a look at who are the 144,000. And we discovered that that group is the ones, they are the ones who are sealed, sealed before the great tribulation. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, Revelation 7, 3, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of God, where? In their foreheads. Now, I'm sorry, I'm a very visual person. Anybody here visual? I imagine that someone is taking a stamp and, and they fly around the world and when God finds one of his people, they go poof, into your head. I know you're laughing. You think that's silly. I went on the internet to try to find an image of someone who, you know, the, have, maybe, maybe had the seal of God on their forehead. I, I didn't want to use any of them. Most of them were like tattoos of G-O-D or, you know, just very strange things. Definitely not what I was looking for and decided to skip the pictures. But in one way or another, we are all intrigued with this idea of a seal of God in the foreheads of those who believe in the name of Jesus. By the way, isn't it interesting that the opposite of the seal of God in the book of Revelation is the mark of the beast? And guess where that is? The mark of the beast is also either on the forehead or on the hand. Very interesting that both of the, the seal and the mark will be on the foreheads of those living at the end of time. One group will have the seal of God, the other group will have the mark of the beast. By the way, there's no third option in the book of Revelation. We will either have one or the other. So if I had my option, I think I'll go with the seal of God. How about you? All right, let's take a look at what the seal of God is. Number one, First of all, it says that they are sealed on their foreheads. That's our verse, sealed on their foreheads. Now, like I said, I, I'm not looking for a stamp or, and I'm not looking for a, a, um, a tattoo. I'm not looking for a sticker. I'm not looking for an invisible Illuminati symbol, symbol on my head. What does the Bible mean? Do you remember how we wrote that the book of Revelation the book of Daniel, they are in prophetic code. They are, they're prison letters. They're written for believing Christians who know the rest of their Bible. What would this be, this seal? What is God trying to tell us about having it written on the forehead? Well, we need to go into the Old Testament, to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. If you want to read along with me, that's okay. The verses will be up on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Notice what the Bible says, and these words which I command you today shall be where? In your heart. So the first thing he says is, these words which I command you. Well, which words did he command at this time to the children of Israel? It was the Ten Commandments. He had spoken them with his own voice. He had written them with his own finger. And so he says to to Moses, as he's writing here in the book of Deuteronomy, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So the Lord says, these commandments I'm going to give to you, I want you to spend time talking about them. I want you to spend time teaching them. Your children should know them. You should know them. And he says, I want you to spend time with them. That little thing there, that little box, and it holds the Ten Commandments in it, and they walk around with the law on their forehead. Is that what God meant? 
Did he want us? Otherwise, maybe we should be walking around little boxes on our head. Is that what God meant? Is that what God wanted us to walk around with a box on our head? Consider the same question now in the New Testament. Is what God wants is for us to walk around with some kind of seal on our head? Is that what God really wants? You see, it's really the same question. Shall we be like the Jews of old and walk around with tattoos on our head or marks on our head or wait for God to stamp us on the head? Is that what the scripture is teaching? Did you notice the verses that we read just a moment ago? What is it that God wanted with the Ten Commandments? He wanted them taught. He wanted them read. He wanted them talked about. Why would he want us to do that? If we talk about them, read them, and teach them, where are they going to go? Inside of our mind. And so he ends that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6 saying, I want you to wear them here in your mind, in your thoughts. That's why he wants us to spend time with them so that they will get inside of our head and we will know them. Is there something more? Yes, I think there's something more. Look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. The book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. The Bible says, Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Something was wrong with the old covenant, according to verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Uh, that covenant made at Mount Sinai with the children of Israel. It's very simple. Book of Exodus chapter 19, God meets with his children. He has a conversation with them. God presents to them the Ten Commandments. And you know what the people say? All that the Lord has said, we're going to do it. You just tell us what to do, Lord, and we'll keep all your commandments. How did they do at that, by the way? Keeping the commandments of God? They were pretty good at it, weren't they? The, the Old Testament? I think they lasted about 10 minutes, right? And then they were melting down their earrings and they were making golden calves. And they were worshiping idols. It didn't take them very long, did it? So, so that covenant didn't work. Because God made a deal with them, right? I mean, they came back to God and said, look, you tell us what to do, Lord, we'll do it and we'll be your people. And that didn't work. So God says, I'm going to make a new covenant because the first one didn't work. I tell you what to do and you promise to do it. That doesn't work. By the way, Christianity falls into that trap sometimes. We read the Bible and we say, well, God, if you tell me to do that, I'll do it. And we miss the point. There's, there is a different concept here. God wants to transform our lives through the loving power of Christ. He wants to live in our hearts. He wants to make us a new creation. He wants us to be born again. He wants to be saved and redeemed into his kingdom. And a transformed heart full of the Holy Spirit is going to be obedient to God in everything that he says. Not because we can, but because he can and because he's living in us. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what it says in verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Where does God want to write the law? On our minds. And he wants to write them on our hearts. That's where he wants them to be. He doesn't want the laws to be a box on our forehead or a seal on our forehead or, or some tattoo on our chest. God wants them to be inside of us. He wants them to be eternalized. And what does he promise? He says, I will write them there. I will put them in your mind and I will put them in your heart so that you will do them. And then he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. It's a beautiful thing. So he wants them to be sealed on our forehead. Sealed in our forehead, not a stamp, not a tattoo. He wants them to be written in our minds. Number two, the seal is also going to be the Father's name. The Father's name, that's also in the book of Revelation. This one is chapter 14, verse 1. I looked and behold this just a few verses later in Exodus 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Now, what did he say he was going to proclaim? His name. So let's see what the Lord's name is. The Bible says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful 
and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, wait a minute. It says, I will proclaim my name. What were you expecting to hear? I was expecting to hear like, you know, God or, you know, the Lord God. And he did say some of that. But instead, he said other things that didn't fit with name. He said things like gracious, long-suffering, I'm good and kind, I'm, I'm just. I don't let guilty people, I don't let murderers just walk free. I, I am just, but I am good at the same time. I'm, I'm kind, I'm loving. And he describes himself. He's describing his character, his heart. Very interesting. His name is his character, and his character is love. As a matter of fact, he tells us that. The Bible says in the book of 1 John that God is love. That's who he is. So when he describes his name, he's describing himself. You know, names are like that. Names are very powerful. Uh, If we were to mention names of people that we all know, maybe in history or in, in, um, in our culture, it would bring up certain images to our mind. If I say the word Hitler, that certainly has certain images that it pulls up, very dark uh, feelings, very, very, very many um, you know, horrible ideas and thoughts. But if I say somebody like Mohammed Gandhi, then maybe we have a different feeling about that and what he did and how he lived. With a name comes the person and who they are and what they've done and what they have believed. And in God's name is who he is. His name is his character, and his character is love. So where, then, can we find the name of God? Where is his character spelled out? Where could we find the definition of who God is? Well, you know, amazingly enough, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 2, he begins the Ten Commandments by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He declares himself, remember me, I'm the God who saved you. I'm the God who delivered you by my mighty power. I took you out by my hand. By the way, how much did the Israelites help God get out of Egypt? They were not very good at helping God, were they? What did they do? They got scared and they started doubting at every step of the way. And God had to almost move them to, to, to have faith in him, you know? They, they, they did not help God very much. As a matter of fact, they probably slowed him down. He wanted to do it faster. And they, he wanted to do it more effectually. That's no, the opposite. They don't help God. And so God begins his Ten Commandments by declaring who he is. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who took you out of the house of bondage and slavery. That is my mighty power. That is who I am. Where can his name be found? Where can his character be found? In the Ten Commandments. Right there. As a matter of fact, they all reflect his character. They all specify who he is. They, they specify his goodness, his kindness, but also his justice. And expressed here in the Ten Commandments are, are who God is. What, his value system, his beliefs, the foundation of his government of love is based upon his law. In identifying the seal, we've looked at the seal to, on the foreheads. We've taken a look at that God wants to write them in our mind. It's not a mark that we can expect, although there may be one. I don't know uh, if there's going to be a mark that God is actually going to put on, but I think the Scriptures is teaching more that God wants to write in our minds His seal. Also, uh, the Father's name, God wants to write in our hearts His character, His love, His goodness. He wants to write His law in our lives so that His name will be in our hearts and in our lives name. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at the seal of the President of the United States, it would be Barack Obama. It would be President of the United States of America is his territory, and that's what his seal will say. And if he stamps a document with his seal, it will have all three things and will show the authenticity of the document that he writes. So I guess we would have to ask the question, where in the Bible will we find God's seal? 
Where would we find God's seal on his document? And where would he put his seal so that we would know that where, that where his seal is, that document is valid and it's true and it's his? Well, I believe that we'll find it right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. How about you? I believe that we'll find God's seal in the midst of those Ten Commandments that God gave on Mount Sinai. Let's look at the Sabbath commandment, beginning with verse 8. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day. Isn't it interesting that God begins that with remember? You know, if God said, remember something, what does it probably mean about us? That we're going to be for probably forget. And so right in the Ten Commandments, he says, remember. He doesn't say, remember not to kill, does he? Does he say, remember not to lie? But he does say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, doesn't he? Because he knew we'd be prone to forget. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. By the way, whose Sabbath is it? It's God's Sabbath. It's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's not our Sabbath. It's God's Sabbath. It says it belongs to me. It is my day. It's the Sabbath day, right? He continues in verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now we're going to focus in on this verse for a moment because I believe that right here we're going to find the elements of God's seal. And he's going to seal his own document by proclaiming his name, by proclaiming his office, and by proclaiming his territory. First of all, do we see the name of the Lord in this document? Absolutely. For in six days, the Bible says, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. That's his name. And his name is on a seal. Not, not only do the Ten Commandments uh, um, highlight his character, his goodness, his love, his principles of his government, but also he stamps it and he puts his name for six days, the Lord. And then his office I believe that the office of creator is highlighted. He is the creator of all things. As a matter of fact, he is the Lord who made. He is the maker. He is our maker. He is God. And lastly, we will find that his territory is spelled out in this commandment. His territories as the heavens and the earth. For in six days, it was the Lord who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. All of that belongs to God because he is the maker of all things. He is the almighty one. He's the creator. He made us. He loved us. All three elements sealed within that commandment. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. We're looking at the Ten Commandments. We're seeing that God puts his seal right in the middle of it, puts it especially within the commandment that has to do with the Sabbath, naming himself, who he is, who his territory is, as creator of the universe, puts a stamp in it, and yet we live in a world that doesn't honor the Sabbath and doesn't honor God's law. Why? What is going on? What has happened? Well, we kind of need to combine some of the meetings that we've been hearing over time and to take a look at that. What we're going to find in history is that something happened, something changed. And we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to use the documents of the church state power that we looked at earlier, the Roman church state power, and we're going to have to look at their documents because they are the ones who are going to teach us tonight. They're going to make statements about what happened for us to be able to understand what's going on as we study this topic to help us understand what this seal of God is. Notice what they say. This is actually the Catholic Converts of Catechism of Doctrine. This is by Peter Gierman. And I want you to notice what they say in their own document. Very simple. Which is the Sabbath day? They answer, they say, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Now, I didn't write this. This is, within the do this is within the doctrinal study book of those who are studying to become part of the Roman 4, page 153. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment to refer to Sunday as the, Lord, Lord's, as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. What did they just say? They said that they changed the commandment of God so that it would stop reflecting the Sabbath and that it would begin reflecting Sunday. By the way, you can look at the commandments 
uh, 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 in any published doctrine or literature of, of the church, of their church, and you will see that they specifically change the, the third commandment. By the way, they took away the second and they moved it. It's very confusing. <laughs> but, the, but there is no second commandment also in their commandments, and they moved the fourth to third. But they literally say, we changed it. We did it. Continuing, it says, Protestantism, that's us, in discarding the authority of the church, has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought to logically to keep Saturday with the Jews. So then they point a finger at us, and this is their writing, and say, wait a minute, if you're not a part of us anymore, then why are you keeping our day that we changed? What? Did they just say that? I think they did. (laughs) I think they just said that. They're saying you should logically keep the day that the Bible tells you to keep. You should be keeping Saturday with the Jews. Wow. I never heard that. You know, when I heard this stuff, I was like, what? (laughs) It's confusing, right? But at the same time, it's very clear what they're saying. These are not my words. These are theirs. They continue. This is from Canon and Tradition, page 263. The authority of the church could not therefore be bound to the authority of the Scripture because the church had changed the Sabbath to Sunday, not by the command of Christ, by its own authority. Jesus didn't change the Sabbath to Sunday. It was never changed at all in the Scriptures. Here, the church is saying, we admit it. We did it. We did it. We changed it. We transferred the solemnity. There's no command of Christ. It is by our own authority. By the way, this shouldn't surprise us. We've been studying all the way up until now, that the great deceptions at the end of time will have to do with the decision of whether God's people are really going to follow God through his word or whether we are going to follow the traditions of the church. And it shouldn't surprise us that at the end of time, we are finding that the deceptions are huge. They're enormous and they're numerous. That the devil has actually entered into the Christian denomination and has actually twisted the words of Scripture so that we can't even see through the lies, that we have to actually come to meetings like this to find out, what? Does the Bible really say that? Wow. question today is, can Sunday sacredness be supported from the Bible, or is it merely a relic of the church tradition, a command of the Roman church state? That's the big question we have to answer tonight. Is Sunday sacredness a real teaching of the Scripture or not? Is it? That's what we have to find out. Let's, let's discover what the Bible answer is. Number one, let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, and we're going to open there together because um, we want to look at it. The book of Genesis chapter 2, right at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, Love for you to open with me and read along with me, as we do most nights. I pick at least one scripture to open up together and read it and kind of dissect it together. And today it's going to be Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. The Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were what? Were finished. Here's the end of the sixth day. The Bible says that God has created everything, and now he is finished. It's all done. There's no more creating to do. He's made everything as perfect as God can make it. And in verse 2, it tells us what he does after he's finished at the end of the sixth day. The Bible says, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Yes, I know why God rested. He rested because he was exhausted. As he explored the creation and enjoyed it, he enjoyed it with them. God rested. By the way, was Adam tired on his first Sabbath day? When was he created, by the way, according to the Bible? At the end of the sixth day. At the beginning of the sixth day? At the very end of the sixth day, he was the last thing that God made, right? So how tired would he be when the Sabbath came? He had been created like 20 minutes before. How tired is he going to be? Does he need to like, oh, the Sabbath, oh, phew. Man, that was a long 20 minutes, Lord. Thank God for the Sabbath day. 
Why is he resting? He's resting because all the work is done. Is there anything that Adam can do to add to what God has done? Not one thing, because God made it all perfect. So what does Adam do? He walks around with God, and he says, oh, Lord, that's really awesome. God says, I know. I know, isn't it? I like that one too. And then he goes, oh, Lord, look at that. He goes, I know, I know, I made that one too. And then Adam looks and says, man, Lord, that's really cool. I couldn't make that. He says, I know, I know, but I could, I did. And you know what Adam does for his whole first day? He realizes he's not God, but he finds out who is. And so the Sabbath day is all about getting to know that God is God and we are not God. It's not about like, oh, I need to rest because I'm so tired. That's not the original purpose of the Sabbath. It's to recognize that we are not God and that he is. And so as we reflect on creation, we see, we see the beauty of God's creative, amazing power. Continuing, the Bible says, And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Verse 3, Then God did something. The Bible says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. How easily do we fly over these words and not think about them? What did God do to that day? He blessed it. What is on that day that no other day has? A blessing. Can you change that blessing from the seventh day to the first day? Can you change that blessing from the Sabbath day to Wednesday? There is a blessing that God put on that day, and that does not move. That does not change. You cannot experience that blessing on another day because God only put it on that one day. It doesn't say God blessed every day. It doesn't say that. It says God blessed the seventh day, and on that day is a blessing. But not only did he bless that day, but he did something else. The Bible says that he sanctified that day also. The the word sanctified is a big religious term that we use all the time, but it simply means that he separated it or he set it apart for a holy purpose. He sanctified it means that he set that day aside, he separated it from every other day, and he separated it for a holy purpose, for a a purpose that only God can do. He says this day is going to be set aside for holiness. On this day, it's going to be a special day for me. It's going to have a blessing in it. It's going to be set aside. It's going to be holy. And it's going to be the seventh day. It's going to be the Sabbath day. And on that day, Adam, you're going to rest with me. That was pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. You know, there are some, as we read in the writings of the Roman Church State Power, there are some that say, we transferred the holiness off of the Sabbath and we put it on Sunday. Now, if God blesses a day, who are we to take God's blessing and to move it to another day? We would have to be greater than God, wouldn't we? To take his blessing and to move it, to take his sanctification, his holiness, his separation of the holy use, and to move it to another day? We would, we would have to be God, wouldn't we? We'd have to be greater than him. That's audacious. As a matter of fact, it shouldn't surprise us because we read that this power would be blasphemous power, that this power would claim a prerogative of way more than what God ever gave to the church, but they claim it. I love this passage. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he read. A sign, does he mean like a sign in the ground with an arrow? Is that what he means? It means a sign of obedience. How do, God says, I will know that you are my people when you obey my commandments, and it will be a sign between us. That specific commandment will be a sign that will show that we have relationship, that you know that I'm the Lord your God. He continues, Ezekiel 20, verse 12, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who what? sanctifies them. So not only does God sanctify the day, but he sanctifies us. And it's a sign that he is the one that sanctifies us. What does sanctify means? Sets us apart for holy use. 
When we come to God on the day that He set aside for holy use, God sets us aside for holy use. He is the one that works in us. He is the one that transforms our heart. He is the one that makes us a new creation. The Bible is teaching that the seventh-day Sabbath, it is a sign that it is God alone who can make us holy. You know, it's amazing to me that I get accused, or, you know, all the time, that um, it's legalism to keep the Sabbath holy, that that's legalism. But it's the direct opposite of what the Sabbath means. It's a day of rest, not work. I'm not doing any work. I'm resting. And so I thought legalism was doing something. I'm not doing anything. I'm enjoying the, ga- the day that God has made. When we rest on the Sabbath, we cease from our labors. We stop working and we trust in God's perfect salvation. That's what it means to rest on the Sabbath day. You see, our own works cannot make us holy. We must trust in and rest in God's work for us. You see, you and I cannot save ourselves, can we? Not at all. And so we have to trust in salvation, don't we? Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. When did God finish his work of creation? At the end of which day? The sixth day. It was finished, right? All creation, everything he made. Let's jump a Let's jump forward about 4,000 years from the time of creation, and let's go to the cross. By the way, what time of day approximately did Jesus finish redemption? I think it was a Friday at the end of the day, wasn't it? That's the sixth day. We call it Friday. But it was the sixth day of the week at the end of the day. When did he finish redemption and salvation? He finished it at the close of the sixth day. By the way, it was so close to the Sabbath that they broke the legs of the other thieves to take them down. But when they got to Jesus, he was dead before the Sabbath arrived. He had already died of a broken heart. Isn't that interesting that Jesus' last words as he was finishing the work of salvation was, it is finished. Now, can we add to that work that Jesus did? Can we help him with salvation? Are there any works or, or good things that you can do that would help Jesus to save anyone? Absolutely not. It's a, it's a work that Christ did. It's a work of God to save, just as it is a work of God to create. And so, celebrating the Sabbath, by the way, what did Jesus do on the Sabbath day after he finished the work of salvation and redemption? He rested in the grave on the Sabbath day. And when the Sabbath was over, what did he do? He rose from the dead. He kept the Sabbath even in death. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Therefore, the Sabbath is a sign of trusting totally in Christ's righteousness and not in our own. It is a sign of trusting in Christ's righteousness and not ours at all. Because when we rest, we are admitting that we have nothing to do with the work of creation, that we have nothing to do with the work of salvation, that it is a work that God did and not us. It is a sign and symbol of creation. It is a sign and symbol of redemption. The Sabbath day holds much meaning. It has a purpose in God's work, in God's design. It is meant to teach us the truth of the righteousness, which comes only by faith and rest. The the Apostolic Creed, Book 7, Section 2, O Lord Almighty, Thou hast created the world by Jesus Christ, and hath appointed Mark chapter 2, verse 28, Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. He is Lord of a lot of things, Jesus. He's Lord of heaven and earth. He's Lord of all things in the universe, but he is also Lord of the Sabbath. The book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 5, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, also of the Sabbath. Jesus often healed on the Sabbath, and Jesus himself kept the Sabbath day. We find that in the New Testament. Jesus loved people. He helped people on the Sabbath. He made it a beautiful day. The Bible also says in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I want to make this point strongly. The Sabbath isn't meant to be some burden that we all have to do because we all have to obey God's law. It was a blessing. It's a day of resting in God's perfect work. 
The, it, the day is set apart for holy use so that we can spend time with the Lord. It is a rest from our typical normal labor, and it's a time for us to gather together to worship, to fellowship, and to meet our Creator who promises a blessing on that day. Friends, there is a blessing when we worship the Lord on the Sabbath day. This day was made for us. We were not created to worship some arbitrary day. The day was made as a blessing for us as a whole creation. By the way, does it say the Sabbath was made for Jews? Does it say that, does it? Okay. In the the book of Genesis chapter 2, when the Sabbath was made, were there any Jews? So who did God design should come to him on the Sabbath day every week to worship him? All of us. Everyone. That was God's design. Jesus kept the Sabbath even in his death. Even in his death, he kept the Sabbath. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. In 108 languages of the world, 108, the word for the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. Do we have any different languages here? Spanish? Anybody speak Spanish? Right? What is it? Sabado. What does that mean? It means Sabbath. That's what it means, literally Sabbath. Any other languages here? Yes. Sabota, and that means Sabbath, right? Any others? Yes. And what does that mean? It means Saturday or Sabbath. So isn't that interesting that we see in 108 languages of the world that the, literally the day is called Sabbath. The day is called Sabbath. Even Paul in Acts chapter 17 verse 2, Paul kept the Sabbath. And Paul went in as his custom. And on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures. What was Paul's custom? To go to church on Sunday? To go to church on Wednesday? To go to church on Tuesday? What was Paul's custom? It's to go to church on the Sabbath day. He went into the synagogue. He taught. He explained the scriptures. And he pled with them and cried with them. The Sabbath is all about Jesus and our relationship with him. It's not a law to be kept. It's a a relationship to be experienced. Because the Lord of the Sabbath wants to walk with you on the Sabbath day. He wants to experience a relationship with you on the Sabbath day. We're so busy in this world, running to and fro. We're always running like crazy. We're always being stimulated by information. And God wants our attention. He wants our love, and he wants our relationship. He wants our relationship. Despite the overwhelming evidence, three main passages are cited. You see, there are many people that still wondered if the Bible teaches Sunday sacredness and Sunday observance. Does the Bible teach this? Is there anywhere in the scriptures that we can find a verse that says that, where the Bible says that God or Jesus or one of the apostles transferred the solemnity, the holiness, the sacredness of the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, to the first day of the week? Is there any scripture? Let's look at three scriptures, and let's look at the main three that get quoted. The book of John, chapter 20, verse 19. Open your Bibles with me. We're going to look at it together. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to trick you or to quote some verse that you don't know about. John chapter 20, verse 19, that's the last thing I want to do. I hope that I can be utterly plain and clear tonight and that I can... Anybody else? Anybody else? Do you see any evidence? Anybody like to say they see evidence there? It's not there. It's simply mentioning this is the same day. By the way, what else happened on this day? Jesus was raised from the dead that morning. And so it's being specific that Jesus now, on the same day that he was raised from the dead, is now entering into the room with the disciples and meeting with them. Let's look at our next verse, Acts chapter 20. The book of Acts chapter 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Acts chapter 20. And read verses 6 through 11 is what we're going to read. Matthew chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, excuse me. Acts 20, verses 6 through 11. What does the Bible say? Acts 26. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in the five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, 
ready to part them the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered, and I was going to read through verse 11. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, embraced him, and said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. And when, and now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. Okay? Any evidence there in the whole passage, I read the context, that would say that Jesus changed the Sabbath solemnity from the seventh day to the first day, or the apostles. Any mention there of a change of the Sabbath within that verse? It's just mentioning that they gathered together to break bread. By the way, the Bible says they broke bread every day. Didn't they? That's what the Bible says. So it wasn't unusual for them to break bread together, but is there a change of the blessing of the Sabbath day from the seventh day to the first day? There's no evidence for that in the Bible. Do you see it? Anybody? No evidence there. Last verse, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And verses 1 to 3. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 3. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week. Let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, and there be no collections when I come. And when I am, when I am come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear gifts to Jerusalem, but it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Is there any evidence in this passage where Jesus or any of the apostles transferred the blessing from the seventh day to the first day? Is there evidence? They took up a collection. They did. We, you know, Scripture says they did. They took up a collection, setting aside money on the first day. But is there any evidence that the day Sabbath was changed at all? There's no evidence of that at all. As a matter of fact, there's no passage in any of the Bible that would designate the first day of the week as the Christian Sabbath or as the Lord's Day or any such thing. It doesn't exist in the Bible. It's just not there. There is no passage of Scripture. I believe years ago that um, I saw a letter, there was an offer of reward for $1,000 if someone could find a verse that proved that the Sabbath was changed from uh, the seventh day to the first day. And uh, I don't have a lot of money, but I would put my money behind that. If someone could find a verse that proved the change of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day, I would give the $1,000 because it doesn't exist. There's no, there's no fear that I, I would lose some type of, you know, argument or debate over this thing. There is no passage. We already know how it changed. You see, Jesus Christ is pointing us to his holy Sabbath. It is his day. Who changed the Bible Sabbath? Who did it? God didn't do it. Jesus, he didn't do it. We, we have no evidence. The apostles, the disciples, did they do it? No, they didn't do it. So then the question is, who did it? The Bible tells us who did it. We studied this last weekend as we looked at the marks of the Antichrist power. And in the last five marks, we read that there would be a man at the head, that they would speak blasphemy, they would be a persecuting power, and then number nine, that the power of the Antichrist would what? Seek to change God's times and God's laws. Is there evidence today that the papal church state has sought to change God's times and God's laws. Absolutely. There's plenty of evidence for that. There's plenty of evidence for that, and they've given the evidence themselves. Friends, Jesus Christ is the creator of the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the center of the Sabbath. It is his day. Friends, Jesus Christ is inviting you to keep his Sabbath. Jesus is inviting you to accept his Sabbath day. Friends, there's so many people that ignore God's word today and ignore God's commandments for one reason or another. But friends, I encourage you to see in the scriptures that the Bible does teach us that his sign and his seal is right there in his commandments, that that day is important to God in our relationship, and it's a blessing that you cannot get on any other day. It's a blessing that is set aside by the Lord for us to experience.